Hello and welcome to CMC. I'm Steve Marks, a member of CMC's Board of Trustees and uh, President of Hannah News Service. It's great to see everyone here today for such an important topic. Today, the Columbus Metropolitan Club is pleased to present the National Institute for Civil Discourse, sponsored by the Capitol Square Foundation in conjunction with the John Glenn College of Public Affairs, and in partnership with the League of uh, Women Voters, Metro Columbus, and the League of Women Voters of Ohio. Uh, our sponsors and partners are represented here today by many of their friends and associates. Let's thank them and welcome Charlie Moses, Chairman of the Capitol Square Foundation, to the stage to introduce our forum. Good afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, on behalf of the Capitol Square Foundation and our partner, the John Glenn College at Ohio State University, particularly uh, Dean Trevor Brown and President Drake, thank you for our partnership. Uh, it's an honor to support the Columbus Metropolitan Club to provide a weekly forum of civil discussion on topics of importance to our community and to our country. The mission of the Capitol Square Foundation is to increase public awareness about the Ohio State House and all that happens there. The mission of the John Glenn College is to inspire citizenship and develop leadership. Uh, it's an obvious partnership. It's obvious why we're here today and uh, happy to support the Metropolitan Club in today's forum. In 2009, the Capitol Square Foundation and the Capitol Square Review and Advisory Board created the State House Museum. It's an interactive experience that allows visitors to learn about the three branches of government, the Ohio Constitution, how a bill becomes a law, and Ohio's rich history. We've had a million and a half visitors since the museum opened, and about, we average about 75,000 students through a tour each year. While we were thrilled with the response, we wanted to expand to reach all those students that never got to the State House or couldn't get to the State House. We also heard from teachers that were telling us they needed more resources for civics instruction. And this led, our partner, led us to our partnership with the iCivics and the Glenn College to create iCivics Ohio, a free digital resource for Ohio teachers and students. This includes full class length lesson plans, games, and digital activities. And all, it's all the more meaningful uh, to me because of Senator Glenn's personal interest in this endeavor. This web-based interactive citizenship curriculum is the first of its kind in the United States. And since May 2015, we, when we launched iCivics Ohio, we've had nearly 750,000 visits by teachers and students across Ohio. Uh, we've got information at your table, some propaganda about uh, iCivics Ohio. Uh, if you want to go to the website, it's uh, iCivics.org slash teachers slash OH. Um, the foundation of our democracy requires that we converse, listen, negotiate, and compromise when necessary in a manner that enables us to do the people's work. Differences of opinion, party affiliation should never hinder respectfulness, thoughtful discussion, or friendships, because in the final analysis, we are all on the same team. Uh, to explore this simple yet powerful notion, let us turn to our expert panel. Uh, please welcome former Democratic U.S. Senator from South Dakota and former U.S. Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle. <laughs> A former Republican member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Arizona's 5th Congressional District, Jim Colby. the executive director of the National Institute for Civil Discourse and my former boss, <laughs> Carolyn Lukensmeyer. <laughs> and our host today, Chief of the Ohio State House News Bureau, Karen Kassler. Take it away. Just wanted to note that of the 750,000 visits to iCivics, my 11-year-old son, Jack, is a repeat visitor. He loves it, so kids actually do like this stuff. I, I want to get right to this. I solicited my followers on Twitter, my followers on Twitter and my friends on Facebook for questions here because I see a lot of stuff that gets posted on my own feed and, and I see throughout my day on social media. I wanted to ask people what they wanted to know about. So I want to get right to the questions, but first of all, 
I want to start with a quote here that I ran across. Here's the quote. Divisive rhetoric has become not only disagreement between parties, but a rejection of the legitimacy of the other side, validating a position that your opponents are immoral, un-American, and possibly worthy of being subjected to violence. That was a quote from Benjamin Barber, a political science professor at Rutgers, from a New York Times article about incivility in 1995. So we have been dealing with this for an awful long time. We thought it was bad under President Bill Clinton. Then we thought it was bad under President George W. Bush. Then we thought it was bad under President Barack Obama. And now we think it's bad under President Donald Trump. So I, I want to start with our two members of Congress here and, and put this question out to you. Neither of you are strangers to this in your personal situations. You were both on the receiving end of personal attacks of insulting nicknames, of, of, of some things that even came from members of your own party. And I want to ask you, how did that prevent you from doing what you think needed to be done? How did it get in the way of you doing your jobs when you were on Capitol Hill? Well, Karen, I think it actually strengthens your resolve. First of all, you don't get into politics without a thin, uh, if you have a thin skin. You, you really have to realize that that's part of the political process. And, and I think we go back, we were talking earlier today about how you can document occasions way back in, in Hamilton and Jefferson's time where politics got pretty rough. Uh, we've not had a caning incident on the Senate floor in over 100 years. <laughs> so I have to say, maybe we could say we're making some progress. But I think when you are the victim of that, when you feel it yourself, you're all the more determined to see if there's something you can do about it. But that's just, it's not just the personal experience. It's seen it when it happens to others and the effect of that as it relates to good governance and, and the creation of good public policy. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Tom. I was, when you were saying that, I was going to say thick skin. That's how you have to, uh, have to insulate yourself from it. You really do need to have a thick skin when you go in, into politics. But not everybody does have the, that same characteristic, and that doesn't mean they shouldn't be in politics. So we need to have the civil discourse uh, and a polite way of dealing with each other uh, that makes it possible for people to go into politics. One of the, when I was in Congress, especially towards the end of my time in Congress, when the immigration issue became a really, really hot topic down in my congressional district along the border with Mexico, uh, my town halls became really pretty difficult. And I found that uh, my staff had taken to having plain clothes uh, police there as protection. And when I found out that they'd done this, I said, this is nonsense. We don't need to have police put these things that we, you know, we'll, we'll be just fine without it. They were probably right. This day and age, you probably do need to have that there. But those town halls got to be pretty nasty ones. And so you just kind of let it roll with it and understand that this is not what everybody else is thinking. And I always found that when the, I, I would get into a town hall and it would get really loud and, and I don't want to say violent, but it would be get, getting on the course of being discursive language that was being used there. I would just get calmer and calmer. I'd say, OK, let's just think about that. Let's see what somebody else over here thinks about that. And it helps to calm things down. So there are different ways in which you, you deal with it. But you just got to have a thick skin in all this. I want to ask Carolyn, going back in history, as Senator Daschle just said, you know, this goes back to the beginning of the Republic. Uh, in terms of nastiness yep. and divisiveness, and, and we've all heard stories of historical campaigns where candidates were maligned. I mean, as things have progressed here, isn't this kind of what you expect? I mean, you've been at this now for six years, dealing with civil discourse, and, and you've seen the progression. Is, were you surprised at all with the 2016 campaign? Actually, yes, in terms of how bad it got. And where I think things shifted historically was post-World War II. You don't have examples of that kind of vicious rhetoric lapsing into governing in quite the same way as we're watching today or as we saw in earlier periods of history. And the critical difference that we are seeing all over the country that really hasn't happened before in modern politics, we're now eight months past this presidential election. People who voted for one candidate or the other, and it's happening on both sides, are still vilifying, demonizing, and even hating the people who voted for the other candidate. So just think, very recently, we had a very contentious election in 2000, some of the same issues around the Electoral College and the popular vote. When that election was over, yes, no doubt, many Gore haters held antipathy, Gore, <laughs> Gore voters 
<laughs> held antipathy for George W. Bush for the eight years of his presidency. But you did not see Gore voters acting out behaviorally or in speech against Bush voters or vice versa. This is now like a virus amongst us, the American people. We are holding an emotional space in response to this election that, as the Barber quote said, we feel morally superior to people who think differently than we do on the wall or who think differently than we do on tax reform. So this is something that is now amongst us, and we have to do something about it. We need our leaders to as well. But even if they are not capable of it in the short term, we have to take a stand against how it's operating today. So I want to get to some suggestions on how we do that. But has this happened because now we're in a situation where the president himself is actively engaging in some conversations that many people would rightly call uncivil? I think, I think it has to start with, uh, with the, the, the very top. Uh, obviously, the, the thing we need more than almost anything else is good, constructive leadership to set the example. And we're not seeing that today. But I also, it's not just the leadership. It's the way leadership now can use tools that didn't exist 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the tweets didn't exist when when I got into politics. Probably it's a good thing, actually. But, um, but I mean, the social media has really changed. Truth is now just an option. Uh, and, and we see warring sides between Fox and MSNBC. I do this little experiment every, every so often where uh, I, I, I subject myself to a, a, an hour of MSNBC and an hour of Fox side by side. And it's a striking demonstration of the contrast and the way people get their news today. And that fuels a lot of this controversy and this extraordinary uh, confrontation that we see playing, playing out almost daily in the news. Tom's got a stronger stomach than I do. I couldn't watch an hour of each of those every day. There, but he doesn't do it, it every day. Okay. No. I, I, it, it does start, it's both ways. It does start at the top. You do have to have a president that, that sets the right tone. And I don't think this president is doing that in a lot of ways. But it also starts with the grassroots at the very bottom. It starts with us in our communities here. It starts with us in our schools, in our families, our homes in our schools, what we do with our ch children, how we teach them to respect other children and talk to people. And I think that's part of the problem that we've got here today. And then, of course, it's exaggerated or it's, it's exacerbated by all the social media and the other tools that are available to make it easier for people to have, um, have bad feelings about, other, about others. You know, in Congress, <clears throat> the, 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 the way things go now and the amount of time that members have to spend raising money, being back in their districts, doing things for their constituents, members don't socialize with each other. And that's a big difference about what the way the Congress was 25 or 30 years ago. I always say one of the terrible things that happened was the advent of jet travel. Before jet travel, members came to Washington with their families and they lived there. And they were there on the weekends and they would have barbecues and they would uh, play, kids would play soccer in the backyard. They'd swim in the swimming pools. They got to know each other. Now they come in Tuesday morning. They got a fundraiser on Tuesday night. Wednesday they're over uh, calling from a little room back home to make, raise money. And Thursday afternoon after the last vote, they're out of there. So they don't socialize with each other. They don't really know each other. And if you don't know somebody, it's a lot easier to say nasty and ugly things about them than if you've spent time with them and getting to know them on a personal basis. But how, how do you do that when your constituents want you to come home and know them? Uh, it's, 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 it, that's part of the problem. It's we used to be, it's the scarlet letter now if you actually have your family in Washington, D.C. No member would do that. They have their, their family back in the district and they fly back home and make sure the kid there with the kids at the soccer games on the weekends, but they certainly wouldn't have their family back in Washington, D.C. Uh, with them. So I, what you have to do is find some kinds of substitutes for that. And I think part of the answer is forcing on, not forcing, but pushing the kinds of interaction that we need to have, which is having lunches together, getting together in small groups, uh, and, and just making it a point of reaching out to somebody you don't know on the other side of the aisle and saying, hey, how about having 
dinner tonight. I, you know, we, I don't have to do anything. Let's go and have dinner tonight. We need to be doing more of that kind of stuff. Now, uh, Senator Daschle just kind of hit on this when he talked about truth is just an opinion. Uh, we have Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. Daniel Patrick Moynihan said that, not Mark Twain, not Abraham Lincoln, not Marilyn Monroe, whoever the internet <laughs> this week says said that. And, and that's part of the problem is this idea of facts. And, and you know, what can you trust? Who can you you believe? Who can you actually turn to who has real information? When we have people on tape saying things when they say they didn't, we have data from government agencies that is being disputed. When we have these basic things that we used to call facts in dispute, if we can't agree on the facts, how can we agree on anything else? Isn't that part of the problem here? That is part of the problem. We haven't really reacted adequately enough or adjusted to the change in technology today. As you say, Karen, so eloquently, I mean, we've now changed the way media has has uh, uh, affected our, our judgment about the way we view government and everything else. It used to be the media was the referee. Walter Cronkite would call the balls and strikes. They were the referee. Now they're the participant. And not only are they a participant, they need to make that participation as entertaining as they can. So we were talking, at least I feel offended by the, by the clock ticking on what the next event's going to be and the cry runs in the bottom and sort of the carnival barking feel you get when you watch cable news today. And I think that's changed. And I think somehow we have to take that into account and adjust to that as we go on and try to adjust uh, more effectively in looking for ways to factually underscore the, the importance of the debates. With, with more uh, access to more information, more sources of information, you would think that we would have better factual information. But in fact, what we have is just this array of in different information that is out there, and people pick and choose, decide, this is, this is my point of view, this is what I'm going to believe, I've got facts to prove it. And so it's, in a sense, the, the overwhelming amount of information that we have available to us works against the idea of actually coming to a consensus on what the real facts are. Carol, I want to ask you to weigh in. Sure. Another element in this, it comes back to what Charlie was talking about in terms of iCivics. You know, in most countries around the world in the Southern Hemisphere or in places that have been dealing with authoritarian or dictatorships, they have actually had media literacy as part of the curriculum in their schools beginning in elementary school. And I think this is another arena in the United States where we need to really be thinking seriously we, part of how all of us figure out what to pay attention to is how much skill or how sophisticated we are in understanding the sources that we're hearing. But we're not protecting our children that way. We're not helping our children grow up in a sense of a context of, yes, this is a different information world. And how do I need to navigate as a person and as a citizen to feel confident in the choices I make about where I get my news? I want to ask you about something Representative Colby just kind of referred to, the whole idea of being in that dark room raising money. How much money is in politics? And isn't that a big part of this, that uh, you, you have to raise money for the next election? The next election is your primary goal, almost. Doesn't that make a difference here? And how do we, how do we get to some solutions on that? That's it. I think it's really one of the biggest challenges we face. The typical senator has to raise $15,000 a day, a day. And so, as Jim noted, they spend an enormous amount of time, breakfast, lunch, dinners, receptions, calling. Uh, they sit in rooms smaller than this stage and, uh, and, and hour after hour call. I, I tell candidates somewhat, not, not necessarily jokingly, that in order to be a good candidate today, you ought to be in direct marketing uh, because so much of it is on the phone calling people you don't know and sounding like you do, asking for bucks. And we've complicated it even more by making anonymous donations now. We don't even have the transparency that we used to have, and that's also a huge problem. And I think the amount of money, I, my, my last race in 2004, the entire amount spent was $50 million, and that was the most up until then. The most expensive race in the last cycle was $125 million. So we've gone from 50 to 125 in just 10 years. So you can only imagine what it's going to be like in another 10. And don't, don't, I just want to add, don't some of the people who donate to, aren't they feeling like they, they have a part of you? That, that, and, and that help kind of creates this tribal uh, attitude, I think, for some people about the party being so important, and that helps 
create some of the division, doesn't it? No question. And not only that, it used to be that members of the Senate uh, were restricted to two or three committees. Well, now it's not uncommon to be on six or seven committees. And the reason why is each committee has its own fundraising base. Uh, agriculture has its own fundraising base. Finance, banking, education. And so they get on all these committees in part because it just expands their capacity uh, to reach the base that that particular jurisdiction in the committee has. Uh, I'm going to disagree a little bit with this last point uh, because I think that we still have the same limits on the amount of money you can raise from an individual that we've had for the last 20, 25 years. And so when it's like ants on a hot griddle, you have to, to raise the amount of money you need. You have to find more and more. You have to expand your base. You have to get to more and more people. You have to spend more and more time doing that. There are the huge donors that are outside, but those are in the PACs, the super PACs. Uh, and, and so forth. And I was just going to make one point when Tom was talking about the cost of the Senate race. How about this special election in Georgia, $50 million to, for 18 months to represent one-tenth of Georgia in the United States House of Representatives? You know, this is insane. This is crazy, the kind of thing. But that's the way, that's the way the money. And of course, those individuals didn't raise all that money themselves. There were, they had all these outside groups that were raising the money and bringing it into this the state of Georgia for them. And Karen, just one last thing on this. We've debated in the Supreme Court now for the last almost 50 years <laughs> whether money in campaigns is speech or property. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally believe there's not even a question. It's property. If money is property like everything else, but the court on a five to four decision has ruled consistently in recent years that it's, that it's speech. And that at, at, at the heart is really what we've got to address if we're ever going to fix this. And if I can speak about the public's view of this, which we hear all the time, in fact, usually when I'm on call-in radio shows or television, happened this morning on the Ann Fisher show, the public's view is that this big money coming from the bigger donors and coming from the PACs is that what matters now in politics is just wealthy people and special interests. So what am I to do? It's a real disengagement. It's a real disempowerment. Tragically, for some of them, it means that they actually withdraw from the field totally, even stopping voting. We're doing focus groups right now with people who chose not to vote in the 2016 election. And very often, the primary cause is money. And most often, the secondary cause is the just complete incivility and disrespect. The word that gets used most often when we hear from the public relative to the size of the money that's going into politics is that it's immoral. And they then say, you know, we could give early education to every child in America with the $7 billion that was spent in the 2016 presidential election. So the public is really disturbed by this. I, I just noticed that, Representative Colby, you said you disagreed with Senator Daschle. Disagreed. That's it. It was very civil. It was a very nice <laughs> moment there. I just want to draw attention. I, 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 I'm wondering if part of the problem here is that a lot of the people who are part of the problem are not in the room here. These folks are all committed yeah, to this and interested. Isn't part of the problem that you need to reach people who are not interested in being reached? Yeah, they've, they've already made up their minds. They've, they're not here today because they don't want to listen to this conversation. They know what the facts are. They know which, who's the right one and who's not the right one. And so they don't need to bother and come and listen to this today. Yes. How do you reach those folks? Well, there's, there's the, old, the old joke about the politician addressing the voter. Why is it? Is it ignorance or is it apathy that you're not involved? He says, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> 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 well, we have to bring them to know and we have to bring them to care. And I think it's, again, it's partly it's leadership. You really have to inject leadership here from the top all the way down. And as Jim said, from the bottom up. And I don't know that we're, and that's really partly what, what Carolyn is doing with this organization is trying to engage people in a way that brings them to a better understanding of the importance of participation. I mean, don't, don't you worry that, I mean, we had a congressman who was shot fairly recently. Is, the, is that the level that we're approaching here, or was that maybe something unrelated? <clears throat> well, given the origin of our institute, which was the last time a member of Congress was shot, this is another metric, if you will, about how difficult it is to get media attention on doing good work. NICD has existed for six years. 
Ted Celeste, a former member of the Ohio Legislature, leads our state-based program. We've worked diligently in 15 states bringing legislators across the aisle to work in a bipartisan way to pass legislation. It's a smashing success. When we work in those states, an individual story gets told locally. We have tried for five years to get a national story. This is now more than 500 legislators. I mean, it's a great story about positive work. However, and I'll go back to my start point, the very first time in six years sitting in this chair that we have had un worked at by us any attention from national media for the work we do was after Representative Scalise got shot. That's a very sad metric about what it takes to get positive information into the national narrative. We still do pretty well locally where there is a balance between what isn't working and what is working. But to get it uplifted to the national level that people really are working on these issues, people really care about these issues, is extremely difficult. Representative Coley, did you want to join in there? Yeah, just, just to say that you know, as we have had these, as we've already pointed out, we've had these periods in, in the past in our history. And probably if you were to look at the worst decade of American history for this kind of thing, for the violence in the public life, it would have been the 1850s. But we know how that ended in a civil war. There was a tragic civil war that killed more Americans than any other war that we've been involved with. Uh, so we don't want it to end that way. And it's not, I don't think it's going to. Uh, but we have to figure out a way to get around this and we have to figure out a way to, to restore the kind of civility that we need in our public discourse because we're really lacking uh, in that today. So I want to ask what the folks here can do. You folks are engaged. You want to see some change. What would you suggest that these people do? And, and it's very easy to suggest that maybe nothing will happen, that nothing will change. As a friend of mine on Facebook put it, can you even unpoison this well at this point? What would you tell these people that they can go out and do? Well, this is exactly the reason that the Institute has an initiative to revive civility and respect. And I'm going to go back to your issue about people who are unwilling. I think it's very simple at this point. You can take the American population and probably divide them into three categories. Those that are very concerned about how this incivility has seeped into our daily lives in addition to what our leaders are doing and want to do something about it, really care and really want to change it. There's another group that know it's a problem, but they're hanging on to the emotional baggage of this election and they are unwilling to do it. And then there's some that are not paying attention at all. The, way, the philosophy we're taking at the Institute, you are the right audience because you see the issue and you are willing to take action. We think there are three things that you can do. One is we are widely distributing across the country a pledge to civility, similar to what the freshmen in the House of Representatives have done, which is to stand up and say, this has to change. That's a very bright light of a 46 members in the House of Representatives that have pledged to be civil with one another and to influence their colleagues. The second thing is you yourselves to engage some people who think differently than you do. And you can start with the willing. You don't have to go find someone who's not open to this. But in Ohio, you've got a budget crisis. You've got a possible redistricting initiative. You've got an opiate crisis where there's huge disagreement amongst Ohioans about what's the government's role and what should be done about the opiate crisis. And I'm sure there are many that I have no cognizance of. But we have the materials, we have the support, if you're willing to engage people in a conversation who think differently than you do. And this could be very much in your neighborhood. I'm getting calls from ministers, rabbis, and imams about congregations, synagogues, and mosques that have not really been the same working as a real community internally since the election. So the place to do this can be very close to home. And then finally, to organize some larger discussions. We are partnering with many organizations in Ohio. I see the Humanities Council sitting right in front of me, the Interfaith Council, a lot of school systems. We hopefully will be working with universities and community colleges where we will provide the support for you to hold a community conversation on one of these difficult issues and take a step back to what just got demonstrated here. We can dif disagree even very, very strongly, but in the end, 
What we care most about is the core ideas that America stands for in terms of inclusion, liberty, justice, and we can't leave the other half out of that inclusion. So we really hope you will join us in this initiative. Just to follow up, and Carolyn's got it all, all correctly there, just a <clears throat> personal little story there. One of my former staff persons, who is a, a brilliant guy in, in, in international economics and trade, very pro-free trade, very moderate, has taken a position, much to my surprise, in the a Trump White House as a very high-level position there uh, on trade. And thank God we have got somebody that's speaking out on some of these things uh, in the administration. But he told me that when his neighbors found out he had taken this job, they ceased talking to him. They, wow. No one is in the neighborhood will talk to his family any longer there. And, and this is just across the river in Arlington, Virginia. And you know, there's, there's no reason for that. We should be able to have the conversation to say, why did you do this? How are you doing? And you know, what kind of things do you think we can do that can change things there? So reach out to somebody in your neighborhood and have a conversation with them. Perfect. And, and also how, how people who want to reach somebody in public office who, who they feel might be a help or part of the problem. How, how Senator Dasha, would you encourage people to reach out to actual public officials or people in those public officials' offices? Well, I can say from personal experience that it really does make a difference when people, when your constituents reach out to you and emphasize something. It really, sometimes, I think a lot of people sort of discount whether it matters, whether you contact a member of Congress today. It matters a lot. Uh, I, 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 it used to be, and I don't know if they, it's probably not quite the same as it used to be in this context, but I, members, when I'd ask them if they, if they were going to vote for a certain thing, he'd say, well, I've got to vote my mail on this one. And by that they mean I've got to vote what my constituents are telling me I've got to do. Well, I don't think most of my former colleagues hear enough from their constituents about the importance of this issue. So if you did nothing else but to communicate uh, your hope that they will act in a civil and a thoughtful way with better and greater tolerance for those who don't share their view, that is a contribution that I think could make a big difference. And, and don't forget to respond to them when they do something positive. Exactly. Because that, they need positive support when they're actually working across the aisle and actually, you know, an attaboy and attagirl is just as important as the, wait a minute, don't do that again. Right. Now, in a few minutes, we will move to your questions from the audience, but I want to ask one final thought here as we move into that area. This whole idea of disagreement being hate, I mean, is disagreement hate? Can you agree with someone's overall philosophy but disagree with the way they do things? How, how do you get to the point where disagreement doesn't turn into hate? You've got, what you have to do is create environments for more constructive conversation. One of the things that I lament is that there aren't enough joint caucuses today in the Congress where the Republicans and Democrats break bread together. I, unfortunately, was leader when we had impeachment, when we had 9-11, we had two wars, we had the anthrax attack in my office, and each one of those crises required almost that we brought everybody together in the Senate, and it made a big difference. I don't think they do enough of that. I asked a former colleague not long ago, when was the last time you had a joint caucus? He actually couldn't remember when that was. And so there have to be more, uh, the creation of more uh, venues for a dialogue and, the, and the, the building of relationship, at least to take in part uh, what used to happen as a matter of course, when people socialized because their families were here. That doesn't happen. We've got to create them now, and uh, we need to do a better job of that. I remember after 9-11, that night, whenever we all gathered on the steps of the Capitol, House, Senate members, Republicans and Democrats, and spontaneously burst into song of God Bless America. It was an extraordinarily emotional moment. You wish somehow you could capture that, like capturing a firefly in a jar and keeping it going, keeping it alive. We had the same kind of thing on the floor of the House this, just a week, two weeks ago, after the shooting of, of, of the of Majority Whip Scalise. Uh, and this coming together, if somehow we can capture that spirit and, and keep it alive and keep it as part of the ongoing discourse, that would make a big difference. But, but both of those things that brought people together as you... that you, tragedies. It, and that, that's extraordinary that that's the kind of thing that it took to bring people together, and how long did it last? Yeah. So before I became the executive director at NICD, for 18 years I led an organization, which I hope some of you have heard about and participated in, called America Speaks. <laughs> Thank you. 
And we did exactly what Senator Daschle said. We created safe spaces for demographically representative members of the public to come together and talk about tough issues, health care reform, de debt and deficit, 9-11, New Orleans after Katrina. It demonstrated time and time again that if you bring people together, they strongly disagree on these issues. But if you create a safe space, if there's a good facilitation process, the American public cares, the American people, I want to say, care more about solving problems than they care about an ideological identity, except for a small percent on both ends. De Tocqueville said this about us in 1837, that we as a people mainly carry the impulse to solve the problem going forward. So I do feel what to me gives me the co most confidence that we can get out of the mess we are in right now is us. It is, is institutionally finding the support to bring people together to once again discover the larger goal of the ideals on which this country was founded is so much more important than the mess we're in. And it, it's interesting, you, you mentioned safe spaces. That's one of those, those words that gets thrown out there on social media that, that gets made fun of and, and you know, that, that helps to lead to some of this real uncivil conversation that's out there. So it is now time for questions, and I'll go through the speech here. You all know it, but still. It is CMC's tradition to take audience questions, thank goodness. Please state your name, ask your question, and we thank you in advance for not making long editorial remarks. <laughs> Do we have a question here, a first question here for our panel? Um, I'm John Connor, uh, from the, uh, retired from the 10th District Court of Appeals. You know, what? I'd like to hear your comments on redistricting and the, and the way that um, the states are able to carve so safe, you know, so you're in a congressional district, you can't get beat, and so you don't listen to, you don't listen to the people, you just push your philosophy. That seems to me one of the big problems, and, and uh, tell me how, you know, we could deal with that. Thank you. John, you're absolutely right. That's really one of the biggest issues now. There's only about, Jim can correct me if I'm wrong, but around 40 competitive districts in the, out of 435. Uh, in the general election. So the primaries are now more important than the general in the overwhelming percentage of, of, of House seats, uh, and even in some cases in states. Uh, but that has changed the dynamics a lot. People are worried about getting primaried. In fact, I was saying earlier, there's a, we've, we've given Dick Luger uh, the quality of being a verb today. People don't want to get Lugered uh, because he was beaten in a primary. And, uh, and, and so that's a common lament. I don't want to get lugered. I don't want to get primary. And what they're saying by that is they don't want their base to be upset with them uh, when these issues come before them. And so in order to avoid the confrontation with their base, they're going to be as, as, as supportive and as uh, responsive to the base as they can at the expense of everybody else. And that has created a dynamic where we see even greater polarization, people more worried about their base than they are the voters in the middle. And that has changed the complexion in the House and Senate a great deal. If I might add, there's no easy answer to this question because there's, a, you can have, there's flaws to the election commissions that exist in a lot of states, even like Arizona. They're not perfect by any means. But let me just tell you about an experiment that I think is worth watching, what California has done where the two top vote getters go to the general election, whether they're Republican or Democrat. That means if it's a heavily Democratic district, the two top Democrats are going to go to the, but if you want to be the number two Democrat, maybe you want to be able to reach out to more moderate Democrats or even Republicans to vote for you. So you're going to be one of those on the ballot at the end. And I think it's having this effect in California of kind of pushing the candidates towards the center. In the, in the heavily Republican and heavily Democratic districts. That's actually the way that Columbus's mayoral race and many cities' mayoral races go as well. I know you invited Jim to disagree, but Charlie Cook, who follows all these, these redistricting, says there's really only about 25 states that are really, uh, seats that are really, seats, are, seats yeah. that are really competitive in the House now every two years. Renee Delane from Women Who Dare, an inclusion consulting business. 
Um, to your point about getting this information out, because everything often is ground roots and up, and it's organic. You know, sharing messages such as you are today, I certainly intend to go to your work site and, and speak with you individually as well uh, to find out what I can do to add this to more so in my business, for sure. Uh, but you can have franchises throughout the country, but what can you offer in different communities and cities around so we can have little pockets that share and spread your word? Our goal is to provide materials, so discussion guides, video clips that can be used by any organization. We will actually also collaborate with local organizations to do facilitator training. You have some great examples of this already happening in Ohio. Actually, I met to earlier two shout outs in Ohio. A group of civic leaders and former legislators created something called Beyond Civility in Cincinnati and have been doing this work for some time. And I think I saw Steve Stover earlier. He's the chair of the Ohio, uh, the, done in, in honor of former Chief Justice Thomas Moyer, the Ohio Civility Collaboration. So there, we want to work with those organizations to make this as available to any could be an individual, it could be a Girl Scout troop, it could be, anyway, that's the way we'd like to work. And just go to the web. I also should introduce Laura Linton. I don't know where she's sitting, but she is going to represent us full time in Ohio on this initiative. So give your business card to Laura today. <laughs> there you go. And actually, there's a lot of our staff here. Would, I should have acknowledged you all earlier. If the staff who's here today would please stand so people know how serious we are about doing this in Ohio. Hi, my name is Karen Jones. I'm a concerned citizen. And thank you so much for working on the macro. Um, a lot of what you're asking us to do is on the micro level. And I think people are really lo working, looking for skill sets. Um, I think there's some natural confusion with the words civics and civility, where civics refers to government and the roots of civility are actually in the family and humanity. Um, so I just want to um, do a shout out for skill sets, you know, active listening, um, empathy, nonviolent communication. There's a whole table full of us here who are part of a 501c3 um, that work on these issues. But I also want to call out the, the fact of the power differential that so often happens and really encourage us all to find skill sets that acknowledge that and also acknowledge that stress is such a huge factor and so when you know and that can change on a dime so we need skill sets that are really nimble and they're out there very well oh, said you. i saw your table sign earlier in terms of compassionate conversation that we have got to meet you <laughs> <laughs> Another question. i would just i would just add to that I, I, a word that i i don't think we we give adequate time and priority to is the word tolerance. We just don't seem to be as tolerant to society sometimes as we need to be. It, it could be racial, it could be religious, it could be political, it could be any one of a number of questions. But I think tolerance is essential to a strong democracy. And we've got to demonstrate more tolerance, not less tolerance. And I hope we can put that high on the priority list as well. Tolerance and compromise both seem to be things that there are those who have a viewpoint that those are, are weaknesses anymore, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And the, part of the base, I think the base message to both the Democrats and Republicans now is compromise is capitulation. And uh, that's unfortunate. Compromise is not capitulation. Compromise is the essence of resolving issues as we attempt to self-govern. And we've got to recognize the importance of compromise as really the essential element to good governance. Question. Yes. Hi. Todd Kleismit. I'm with the Ohio History Connection. And I should probably start by uh, saying that I just returned from a week's vacation in uh, Senator Daschle's home state of South Dakota. Thank so thank loved you. it. Thank you. Um, I'm very passionate about these issues. I want to okay. thank you for what you're doing, all of you, including Ted Celeste and others here in Ohio. So thanks for what you're doing. Please keep it up. I want to do as much as I can to help. There's about 10 things I'd like to say, but I think I'll, I'll limit it this Get right to, to the question, one question. If you could is uh, I know there are organizations like No Labels and others that are uh, trying to cultivate bipartisanship. Could you talk to 
us a little bit about what No Labels is doing and to what extent you're working with organizations like No Labels. Thank you. Well, uh, No Labels has, uh, has put a real emphasis on, on getting away from labels, getting away from descriptions in one word, whether it's Republican, Democratic, conservative, liberal. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to be said for what they're trying to do. I work with them occasionally. They've been very good about being inclusive and working with other groups. But their essence is that they want to create ways with which to establish venues for communication and dialogue that just don't exist today. So I, I give them a great deal of credit for the effort they're making. Question. John Cavanaugh, I'm a longtime friend of Carolyn's. Um, I want to get to uh, Representative Colby's point about the lack of interaction between both sides of the aisle. Um, and I think when uh, Senator Daschle was majority leader, I believe you worked closely with Ted Kennedy, who was the liberal lion of the Senate. But I believe you also worked with Dirk Kempthorn, uh, who was a very conservative member from Idaho. Uh, those two members served on the Armed Services Committee, and I found out uh, they worked together to award my dad, uh, who was a retired colonel in the Army, a decoration that uh, had gone awry. And at the award ceremony uh, at Arlington National Cemetery, I, I came to find out that these two people who were totally ideological opposites were friends. They were literally friends. They, they, were civil to one another, they disagreed with each other, but they were friends. And I'm wondering if the solution to this problem is, Carolyn, your program and uh, the program that Ted Celeste has, and I guess uh, Ohio State is now hosting this Next Generation Leadership Institute to provide those venues where you know members of different political parties can at least commune together, talk to each other, and, in, and engage in some sort of uh, a dialogue so that they know each other. And I just wonder if you think that might be the answer for the future, because I think what's happening in Washington does seem to be broken. Okay. Well, let me, let me just say, I don't want us to end this program without making it abundantly clear, from my perspective at least, that there are still a lot of things that go on in Congress where members are still working together. You see, I see it all the time when I'm up there on the Hill. Uh, members do talk to each other. They sit down, they work on pieces of legislation. The problem is it's being drowned out by everything else that's happening, by the media and all the other stuff, which are looking for the negative side of things. And members feel they have to pay attention to that because that's what's going to get them elected. But there still are a lot of people that are working together on pieces of legislation. Uh, it's, it's more difficult than it was before, but it's still happening. Unfortunately, a lot of the big controversial pieces, health care, immigration, yeah. these sort of things, there really doesn't seem to be consensus. And I think that's what, in defense of the media, we're looking at when we see this discord and incivility. I th we have time for two more questions. Go right ahead. Uh, Jeff Brown, trainer in nonviolent communication. Um, I s heard the three categories that Carolyn talked about. I'd like to add a fourth that I perceive. And it seems to be people who actively avoid civil discourse, uh, people involved in the truthlessness movement, shall we say. And um, in the work that I do, I work with people who are in this room, people who are, seem to be genuinely concerned about civil discourse and want it. It seems to me that some people are using as a tactic to get their way lack of truth or fake news or actually uncivil discourse. It's a strategy, a tactic. So my question is, do you see it the same way I'm talking about it? And if so, how do you engage people who are using lack of civility as a tactic? Well, I think it's very hard. And Carolyn and Jim probably want to address it as well. I, I, I do think, as Jim just said, I think that is the exception. But they get the attention, generally. And uh, what we have to do is to either work around them or, or, or try to engage them and uh, see if we can bring about a, a better 
uh, a better discourse uh, eventually. Uh, we can't give up. We just, we were on a talk show earlier and uh, one of the callers said, you know, I just want to give up. I want to just throw up my hands and walk away. Well, that's the last reaction. We really need people to be engaged. We want them to participate. We've got to figure out ways to continue to, to persist. And that would be my recommendation, that we persist, that we continue to make the effort, uh, because ultimately I think we can succeed. To me, there's no doubt that both at the leadership level and in our communities, there are people who are using incivility as a tactic intentionally to not let something happen or to make something happen. I'm going to speak in terms of what we can do about it at a grassroots level. Think of your situation in your community and the circles of influence that you are in. And when you're confronted with the person who is doing the tactics that you talked about, identify the circles of influence that that person is in. And think about it not as a one-on-one -on -one confrontation between you and the person who's using this tactic, but do it as a sociogram. Who do I know? How do I influence that there's an overlap with that person's circle of influence so that they begin to get feedback from people that they care about still respecting them, that that is an unacceptable way to try to get their way? One more question. Thank you. My name is Janet McLaughlin. And I believe that civil discourse begins at the top and with me. And I want to work on me. And I ran across a quote yesterday that says, I will make a space on my path for your thoughts. And that is so hard for me. Can you help me? <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great quote, and it looks like you're already doing it. So you've I'd already, so. you're making the path for <laughs> somebody see. else's thoughts, and that's wonderful. That I love it. that quote. I got to remember that one. Yeah. We do too. <laughs> Thank you. It's beautiful. All right, work. turning it back over to Stephen Marks. Excellent. I hope you enjoy, uh, see this is what happens when you're after Charlie Moses. The, you know, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed today's forum. I, I certainly did. It was a uh, fascinating forum. Uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation with coffees and cookies. Um, as always, you can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Let's thank our sponsors, Capital Square Foundation in conjunction with John Glenn College of Public Affairs, OSU. And, and, uh, and our partners, the League of Women Voters, Metro Columbus, and League of Women Voters, Ohio. And, and our speakers, uh, Tom Daschle, Jim Colby, Karen Lukenspire, and uh, Karen Kassler. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week.